Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is uh, Stan Voiger. I'm a senior fellow here. I'm delighted that we're doing this event um, on Ilya Soman's recent Oxford University book, Free to Move, Foot Voting, Migration and Political Freedom in Person. Uh, it's been a while, uh, for me at least. Uh, welcome as well to our online viewership, which uh, strangely may now have become the default mode for, for these kinds of events. Of course, this choice between watching online or coming to our building to, the, uh, to attend the event is an excellent example of voting with your feet, uh, the topic of our conversation today. Um, the book, as Ilya will uh, tell us in a little bit, uh, highlights that really whether in the context of cities, countries, firms, um, the ability to pick up and, and leave provides an important measure of political and applied by certain conceptualizations of political freedom, economic freedom. It's an incredibly important theme, um, and I was very pleased to see this, this attempt at a unified treatment of the, the topic across areas, uh, various areas of, of, of law, of political science, of, of economics. Um, it's a um, uh, book covered, covers many areas. Unlike many books in the social science realm, it's heavily engaged with both policy and institutional design, I think, throughout, which uh, you often don't see, right? Often you have a, a final chapter where people say, well, here's some policy recommendations that are you know, never going to happen and aren't really thought through here. I think we, the, the, really, I think it's really a great effort to, to do a bit more of that. The book uh, is only about 200 pages long, and it's really written, I think, with a little more of a general audience in mind, and so I would recommend you to, to pick it up. Do not be intimidated. The price is pretty good, too. Uh, well done on, on, on that. Um, and so uh, that's the topic of conversation for today. Proceedings will unfold as follows. Uh, Ilya will present his, his book. He's professor of law at George Mason University's Scalia School of Law, where his research focuses on constitutional law, property law, democratic theory, federalism, and migration rights. Uh, I would in particular recommend that if you have questions about eminent domain, uh, to submit them uh, to him or to, to send them via email uh, later. Um, after uh, Ilya's remarks, we'll hear comments from our two discussants, to, uh, to whom I'm sure Ilya will want to respond. Our discussants are Emily Hamilton, who is Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Urbanity Project at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, Emily's work focuses on urban economics and land use policy. Uh, and then we have uh, Philippe Campanchi, who is Bloomberg Distinguished Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Relations and the Economics Department. Um, his work is focused on, on political economy issues, very broadly speaking, uh, from uh, the importance of national capital locations to the uh, meaning of the, cap of the Africa Cup. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we'll then have a conversation between the, the, the four of us, uh, all of you, and our, our online audience. And um, we'll, we'll end the conversation probably around 4.15, 4, 4, 4.30 at latest. Uh, with that, Ilya, welcome. Uh, thank you for doing this, and please take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Stan and the American Enterprise Institute for organizing this event and all of you for coming. Uh, and thanks also to Emily and Felipe for what I know will be their very insightful commentary. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the themes of the book, uh, and then I'll turn over to commentators and we'll have an interchange and also later, of course, audience questions uh, as well. So uh, the book in its original edition came out uh, in May of 2020. Uh, I had the perfect timing of writing a book about the advantages of freedom of movement at a time when much of the world was in lockdown. So uh, but my hope, if anything good comes out of this horrible uh, COVID crisis, it may be perhaps a greater appreciation for the importance of freedom of movement. More recently, in December of 2021, we came out with a revised edition, which among other things, addresses some new issues that came up during the uh, period of the pandemic, including the argument that we must restrict freedom of movement in order to prevent the spread of deadly contagious diseases, and also the potential implications of widespread remote work for uh, voting with your feet and how that creates some potential new opportunities for foot voting, uh, but also in some cases may reduce the value of foot voting. There's a whole section in the book devoted to that. I address some other new issues in the new edition as well. Best of all, the new edition is significantly cheaper than the previous one. It's available on Amazon right now for only 11 or $12. Uh, and with both the first edition and this one, 50% of all of the royalties generated by this book uh, go to causes supporting refugees who sadly are in more need than ever right now. You've all, I think, probably seen the headlines about 
refugees in Ukraine. When I wrote a column in the New York Times about them last week, there were 1.5 million of them, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, in the two weeks since then, that number has risen to three and a half million. So it's a very sad situation. Uh, so I'll first start out by talking about uh, why voting with your feet is an important mechanism of political choice and political freedom. Uh, most of us will assume that uh, when we really uh, choose that the mechanism of political choice is at the ballot box, voting for the Democrats or the Republicans, for example, uh, I'll suggest that foot voting has important advantages over ballot box voting. Then I'll talk in slightly more detail about the three different types of foot voting covered in the book. Uh, one is foot voting within a federal system, probably the most familiar kind. A second is foot voting in the private sector, less familiar, uh, but I'll talk about how there are private organizations that provide goods and services similar to those traditionally associated with state and local governments. And finally, foot voting through international migration, which is the most controversial kind, but also the one with potentially the greatest gains. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'll talk about some standard objections to expanded foot voting rights and my response to those objections. So first things first, why would we even think of foot voting as a mechanism of political choice when we have ballot box voting? Uh, ballot box voting certainly has very important advantages, but it has two significant weaknesses. One is that the chance that your vote will make a difference to the outcome of an election and therefore to the policies that you end up living under, that chance is very, very small. In an American presidential election, it's about one in 60 million. In a local or state election, it can be higher, but it's still very, very low. In most contexts, we would not say that you have meaningful freedom of choice if you have only a one in one million or one in 60 million chance of making a difference. For example, we would not say you have meaningful freedom of religion if you have only a one in one million chance of deciding which faith you want to practice or whether you want to practice one at all. Uh, and if that's true for these other kinds of important rights, I would suggest it's true of political freedom as well. Uh, the second serious limitation of ballot box voting is closely related to the first. Precisely because the chance of your vote making a difference is so incredibly low, most voters are what economists call rationally ignorant. That is, they devote only very limited time and effort to seeking out political information, not because the voters are stupid, but because there's a lot of other demands on their time, and there's much more of a payoff to learning about other things, many other things, than there is about politics or uh, public policy issues and the like. So as a result, survey data, some of which I compile in this book, and some in my previous book, Democracy and Political Ignorance, uh, they show that most voters most of the time know very little about what they're voting on. Indeed, survey data shows that only about a third to a half of Americans can even name the three branches of the federal government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Uh, about half or more of the public doesn't even know what these things are, uh, much less know about the details of policy. And there's much more evidence of that kind in the book and in my other writings that I can uh, go over if people are interested, but uh, the data on this is pretty overwhelming uh, and stark. Foot voting has an advantage on both of these dimensions. If you're able to vote with your feet by moving to another state or local government or by engaging in international migration or the like, that's a choice that has a very high chance of making a difference to the outcome. It's a much more meaningful form of freedom. Uh, and in part as a result of that, most people also invest more time and effort in learning relevant information about foot voting decisions than ballot box voting decisions. Uh, if you're like most people, you probably spent more time and effort seeking out information the last time you bought a smartphone or a TV set than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or for any other political office. Uh, that's not because the presidency is less important than uh, your, t your TV set or deals with less complicated issues. It's because uh, when you decide uh, what TV set you're going to get, that's probably the one that's going to end up in your living room. Your decision makes a difference. If you flip it on and you have the misfortune of seeing the president or some other powerful politician, your odds of being able to determine who that person is are very low. And therefore, most likely, you devote 
much less time and effort to uh, making that decision. Uh, the American Medical Association says that before a doctor can treat you, they have to get your informed consent. As we've all seen during the COVID pandemic, but even during normal times, decisions of government policy often are also literally matters of life and death, like medical decisions are. And yet most of the time, for most people, ordinary democratic government uh, is a situation where uh, most people don't know whether the doctor's treatments are snake oil or actually treating a disease, and most people have little or no ability to refuse the doctor's uh, ministrations. Foot voting does better on these dimensions, and in the book I also describe at some length how this translates into superiority from the standpoint of a wide range of theories of political freedom, not just you know, one or two, but a wide range of theories associated with both the left and the right. Uh, so I'll talk briefly about the three types of foot voting. One is foot voting under federalism, where we have 50 states in the U.S. and many thousands of local governments. This offers a very wide range of choice to people. And in addition, uh, it's particularly a boon historically to the poor and the disadvantaged, though perhaps, as Emily will discuss in her comments, this is now somewhat constrained by zoning restrictions, which make it harder for people to uh, acquire housing in places that are desirable. Uh, in the book, I propose reforms for that and for a number of other obstacles to mobility. Uh, a second type of foot voting, which is probably less familiar, is foot voting in the private sector. Uh, but we do, in fact, have private sector organizations which provide goods and services that are very similar in many ways to those traditionally associated with state and local governments. The most obvious example, private planned communities like condominiums, homeowners associations, and others. Some 74 million Americans already live in organizations like this, and in the book, uh, I offer suggestions and policy reforms to make this form of organization more available to more people. It is less available to the poor and the lower middle class for various reasons, but that can be expanded. This has important advantages even over foot voting under federalism. One reason is that there's many more options potentially. A second is lower moving costs. Uh, it's cheaper to move to another private planned community nearby than to another state, at least in most cases. And the third is that data show that in many dimensions, services offered by these private organizations are higher quality and lower cost than equivalent services offered by states and localities. Uh, I don't claim that foot voting under federalism or in the private sector can completely displace uh, governmental decision making or ballot box voting, uh, but we can make it much more available than before. Among other things, we can decentralize more functions of government either to the local or state level or even in some cases to private sector. So although this can't cover everything or every single issue, it can cover many more issues than uh, is currently the case. The third and most controversial type of foot voting is foot voting through international migration. Uh, and although obviously it is very controversial, both in this country and in Europe and elsewhere, nonetheless the gains are truly enormous. Why is that the case? Uh, because the difference in quality between nations, the quality of government is much larger in many cases than that which you find internally. Think of whatever you believe is the best governed American state and compare it to whatever you think is the worst. Uh, it's a significant difference, but it's very small compared to the difference between the United States and Cuba, or the United States and Syria, or the United States and Russian-occupied Ukraine. Uh, those differences are enormous. If people are allowed to move freely away from those places to uh, Western liberal democracies, there's an enormous gain in freedom of all kinds, including political freedom. For the roughly one-third of the world's population that lives under authoritarian rule, uh, exercising political freedom through international migration is the only way that they can exercise political choice at all. In addition, uh, international migration has enormous economic gains. Economists estimate that if you had free migration throughout the world, it would double world GDP. That is, the world would be twice as productive as it is now, because right now there are so many millions of people trapped in places where the government is so oppressive, so corrupt, or otherwise dysfunctional, that no matter how smart they are, how hard they work, they cannot hope to escape poverty. So the gains here are truly enormous.
Nonetheless, there are various potential objections. Uh, and in the book, I go through a lot of them, and I divide them into two categories. One category of objection says uh, the governments just have a general right to exclude people. There is a second category which says maybe there isn't a general right to exclude, but sometimes we have to exclude people for particular reasons that bad consequences might occur, such as overburdening the welfare state, spreading harmful cultural values, spreading disease during the COVID pandemic, and so on. Uh, so I'll briefly take the first category of objections first, the ones that argue for a general right to exclude. Uh, one standard type of that is uh, the idea that uh, there, that there's a general right to exclude based on the idea that there's uh, particular racial or ethnic groups which own the uh, particular territory, like France for the French. Another category is based more on individual rights and analogizing the state to uh, the owner of a private house or a private club and saying you can just exclude people. I respond to both of these at length in the book. Here I'll just briefly summarize. With respect to the ethnic right to exclude, I suggest that this is objectionable for the same reasons that racial and ethnic discrimination generally is objectionable. If we object to apartheid or racial segregation within a country, then the international version is no better. Uh, with respect to the analogy to a house or a club, uh, if you buy this, it has horrible implications uh, for natives, not just for immigrants. The owner of a house, for example, can suppress speech he or she disapproves of uh, or suppress religion they disapprove of in their property. If governments have similar powers, that's a justification for a totalitarian state. Uh, finally, I'll just briefly note the issue of the possibility that there should be a right to exclude for particular sorts of uh, negative consequences, like overburdening the welfare state and the like. Uh, and I don't have time to go over all of these, but I, I do go over them in the book. Here, I'll just mention my general framework for addressing them. Before agreeing that this justifies restrictions, we have to ask three questions. First, how big a problem is this really? In many cases, it turns out it's not much of a problem at all. For instance, immigrants on the, on the whole do not uh, overburden the welfare state to actually contribute on that. Second, we should ask, is there a keyhole solution that is a way to address the problem uh, that is less restrictive than excluding people? Uh, and in many, many cases there are. For the welfare state, the obvious keyhole solution is just limiting immigrants' eligibility for welfare like we already do. Finally, let's say there is a problem, there's no keyhole solution. Uh, you should ask, can we tap some of the vast wealth created by free migration for the purpose of alleviating a negative side effect? And in many, many cases, if necessary, we can. I go through examples in the book. Uh, and in the book, I cover many possible scenarios, welfare state, crime, negative cultural effects, negative political effects, the spread of disease, and so forth. Uh, so much more could be said, but for the moment, I conclude. And I very much look forward to the commentary and questions. Thank you so much. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Um, that's ex so honest, listening to you, it, it, it reminds me of how many, uh, how many detailed issues are discussed in, a re in the relatively brief uh, um, number of pages of the, of the book, because there are really entirely, entire chapters that you just summarized in, in three sentences. Um, I want to go to Emily first to, to hear some of your uh, comments. As uh, as India, uh, mentioned, um, a pretty major impediment to freedom to, to move in the U.S is really the core area of the, the core focus of your work, um, which is land use restrictions, zoning restrictions. Um, and ironically, that's an, an area where there is a high degree of federalism and you think, you know, would be appropriate for, for this kind of foot voting. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? What do you just disagree fundamentally with the idea that um, federalism can address some of the problems that he has identified? How, how do you see Sure, yeah. First off, thanks so much, Stan, and thanks for everyone who's here today. And thank you, Ilya. I think you make a, a very strong case for the economic and moral benefits of foot voting. Um, as, as Stan said, um, and, and you mentioned in your remarks, one of the biggest barriers to domestic foot voting in the U.S. is zoning restrictions that make it really difficult to build um, housing in some of the places where demand for housing is biggest. So to a rough approximation, a new person moving into the Bay Area means that someone else has to move out um, under today's land use regulations. 
Um, and this seems to, in the U.S. context, get worse the lower level of governance that is making decisions about whether or not housing um, can get built. And in your book, you call for a devolution of authority to local governments, except in the cases where local governments are standing in the way of foot voting. I very much agree with that um, proposal, but I think it, it's a little bit difficult to see how we get from here to there. And I'd love to hear you talk more about if it's um, limits at the state level, the federal level, or even maybe constitutional reform that's needed to set some limits on the extent to which localities can block housing construction and as a result uh, limit foot voting into their jurisdictions. Yeah, you want to go? Yeah. Sure. So it's a good question. I do talk about this a bit in this book where I talk about, especially in chapter seven, about how you need constitutional limits on local and state government's ability to intrude on property rights. Uh, that's both directly facilitates foot voting uh, by eliminating barriers to it, uh, but also indirectly facilitates it by eliminating a possible negative side effect of foot voting, which is that if a government knows that if they burden mobile assets for mobile people, the, those assets and people will flee, they might instead overburden the immobile ones, of which the most important is property and land. Uh, and I have actually an entire previous article devoted to this issue, which is cited in the book, but which more importantly is available for free online. It's called Federalism and Constitutional Property Rights, which I wrote back in 20, 2011 for the University of Chicago Legal Forum, uh, where I explain both some of the things that can be done and also how it is compatible with my defense of federalism and decentralization on other grounds. I won't go through all the points made in that article, but I will simply mention that uh, if you limit uh, local governments or state governments' power over land use, this is actually a greater degree of decentralization because then, of course, the property owners get to decide uh, how the land is going to be used or will have more ability to decide it. Uh, and so uh, it's not a matter of, you know, the federal government will decide how every piece of land is used or, or a federal court will decide it. Uh, it's that individual owners will decide, and many, not all, but many, uh, will be incentivized to build more housing in response to demand and therefore alleviate the problem that Emily has talked about in her important work and other scholars have as well. Uh, there are other potential approaches to reform, such as using state-level laws to constrain the local level. California is beginning to do this a bit recently, and there have been uh, similar efforts in the state of Oregon and some others. Uh, but I also think, uh, and I have sort of legal arguments for this as well, and so my work on property rights that stronger judicial review in this area uh, should be uh, implemented. Uh, I have other works which are cited in this book, but I don't go into this in detail in this book, uh, where I discuss how uh, the Supreme Court and other courts made a mistake in dropping uh, a lot of judicial review of property rights issues, particularly with respect to zoning, and also with respect to the use of eminent domain. And that's um, around 1920 is when we So 1926 with respect to zoning in the case of Euclid versus Amber Realty. With respect to eminent domain, the leading case is Berman versus Parker, decided in 1954, though the Kilo case decided in 2005 is more famous today. Uh, but Berman- Thanks in part to your book on that. So, it's fine if you want to talk about your true passion. <laughs> so, so I would say I have more of a passion even for the topic of this book okay. than I do for the topic of property rights in eminent domain, but I do have a previous book called The Grasping Hand, which is all about uh, the Kilo case and more broadly about the issue of public use, which is sort of the legal doctrine of when the government is allowed to condemn private property and when uh, it's not allowed to do so. Uh, the issue of zoning is one that I'm writing about more recently. I think zoning, in particular in the last couple of decades, has succeeded eminent domain as the most significant property rights issue in the U.S. In practice because it has this effect on mobility uh, that Emily and others have you know, documented really well, that uh, it prevents people, particularly the poor and disadvantaged, from moving to places where they could be happier, more productive, and so on. And the economic effects alone of this are huge. Scholars estimate that U.S. GDP might be as much as 30 or 40 percent larger if over the last several decades we did not have such extreme zoning restrictions in 
uh, many of the places where we do. And so Emily, when Emily asked, uh, how, how do we get to reform in yeah. that area, you, yeah. so, the, the higher so, levels, the so, ideas so, that so, the higher so, levels so, of so, government. So I mentioned yeah. some ideas, let me summarize, like any successful constitutional reform effort, you want a combination of legal and political action. You want an active litigation campaign, as, be, as has been done to some extent in the area of eminent domain. In zoning, that's just beginning. But you also want political reform to work in synergy with it. This is how the property rights movement has had some of its successes to date. If you look at other constitutional reform movements, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, more recently the gay rights movement, they all succeeded through these sort of uh, combined strategies. Uh, so it's not either you litigate or you do politics, it's that you do some of both. Uh, and I think that the same thing is true here. I would also say that the same thing I think is likely true with respect to the right of migration for immigrants. We both need to use legal strategy to try to erode some of the very bad precedents in this field, but also political strategy as well. Excellent, thank you. So Emily, I know you're, you're also somewhat skeptical of the, the, the private sector uh, uh, solutions that, that Ilya discusses in this in this spatial context. Can you can you talk about that a, a bit? Uh. Sure. Yeah. So um, as as Ilya mentioned in his remarks, one of his proposals for increasing foot voting um, is HOAs, condo associations, or co-ops that can provide um, private sector alternatives for regulating what a, a neighborhood or building. Um, looks like and providing some local public goods in many cases. Um, I am skeptical of these as an exit option from local government um, authorities. And, and you don't propose them so much as, a, as an exit option, but since one of the, the most important factors governing what housing looks like is, is land use restrictions, um, HOAs or condo associations typically offer an option to opt into a more restrictive um, environment. They're not exempt um, or a way to escape from local land use restrictions or, or housing entitlement processes. So um, I certainly support them as a, an alternative that, that works for many people, um, but not as an alternative that seems to provide an option for someone who would like to live in a more liberally regulated environment. I know if you have any answers, should I just save it sure. up? Yeah, no, let's, yeah, let's save the, the, this one up. And I think this, I guess the same goes for business improvement districts and other kinds of constructions like, like that. I know the, the, a, a third issue you wanted to talk about, there's a, the, as Ilya briefly, briefly mentioned in his opening remarks, there's a chapter on, uh, on, on keyhole solutions. Um, yes, and, and, and I, I believe you you weren't super convinced that that's the necessarily the right way to go too. Then, well, yes, um, uh, we do see some um, keyhole solutions. I would say in um, in housing permitting, um, for example, in many localities, it's easier for apartment builders to get um, permits to build their buildings if they're going to um, include only small apartments like studios or one bedrooms. Um, that are typically not going to be home to families with children. Um, and this is because um, localities or, or homeowners may not want to accept um, children who are going to live in multifamily housing and attend local public schools. Um, a, another example that I find less objectionable is um, in DC there have been buildings um, permitted that don't have any um, parking in apartment buildings and residents of those buildings are required to agree not to get an on-street parking permit. Um, and so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on if these keyhole solutions um, are a good thing in, um, in housing markets or um, do we, I, I, I really um, like the way you put this in your um, discussion of keyhole solutions for immigration. Um, the keyhole solutions may seem objectionable to us, but that's because they put the, um, the, the decision more in our face versus the decision to restrict immigration more broadly where it's kind of an unseen, unseen burden for the people who are, are um, harmed by those immigration restrictions. Is it the same in housing or do we need to strive for um, for local governments that are, are more liberal in terms of um, 
allowing housing construction for those who need it most. Do you want to respond to these sure. two? So I guess what, what, what I mentioned to those two, yeah. two, on the issue of HOAs and other private land use arrangements sort of being themselves restrictive, I admit this is an issue I should have talked about a bit more in the book, but I do have a response to it. Uh, with the main point is that even the largest HOAs and other similar organizations don't cover nearly as big a space as zoning restrictions which can apply to an entire huge area like Los Angeles or New York City or whatnot. So even if this one particular HOA is highly restrictive, there can be others around it which are much less so. And if you have people with different preferences, uh, people who like the more restrictive approach can prefer that. People who don't, don't. I teach a famous case in my property class about a uh, condominium association which forbade the ownership of pets almost entirely and therefore this one woman who really wanted to live there with her three small cats she couldn't get an exception even though those cats by all accounts were unobtrusive they weren't causing any harm to anybody but uh, there are lots of other condos which do allow pets and even advertise themselves as pet friendly so you have a lot of options whereas if you have a single sort of zoning model that's very restrictive for all of San Francisco all of LA all of New York City or whatnot, then it's no cats anywhere, right? Or more to the point, no uh, multifamily housing anywhere in many places, <laughs> which is very restrictive and tends to keep out the poor and disadvantaged. So uh, I think diversity in rules between these organizations is often a good thing. I may not like some of the specific rules, but that's fine if I have you know, other options. Uh, on the issue of keyholes, most of the uh, keyholes that I talk about in the book are keyholes for international migration because at least in modern times, uh, the issue of sort of keeping people out because of negative side effects is much more raised in the context of international migration and domestic kind. But as I also note in the book, historically, there is a history of many of the same objections being raised domestically. Uh, so in principle, some of the same keyholes could apply. Uh, the ones that you mentioned, I think, are not great examples in that it doesn't seem like they're actually solving a real problem, right? That it seems like better than that, per, that, that sort of those restrictions that you mentioned are better than more severe restrictions, but better still would just be letting people build what they want, uh, at least with respect to the particular issues you mentioned. They can have a parking lot attached to a building or not having a parking lot attached to it, and I'm pretty confident that will not mean that no parking is available anywhere, uh, especially if people can charge market prices for parking. There's a great book by a scholar named Jerry Shoup called The High Cost of Free Parking, where he talks about how free parking mandates, they're often popular because people, and I admit I'm like this myself, they're like, I hate to pay for parking, I'd rather get the free parking. But when you think about the cost of allocating a lot of land to parking, which could be used for other things, that's actually a high cost, even for the people like me who enjoy the free parking and feel like their rights as Americans have been violated if you have to pay for it or whatnot. <laughs> um, but I understand intellectually that you know, mandating free parking is a bad idea, even though viscerally I kind of like it. Um, uh, more generally, this is, is, is worth pointing out that almost all the objections raised against international migration, if you take them seriously, they can be raised against internal migration. I live in Virginia. Uh, almost anything that can be said against Mexican immigrants or Central American ones can also be said against West Virginians who might move to Virginia. They're poorer than us. They might overburden our welfare state. They have a higher crime rate than we do. Some of us might think that their cultural values are ones that we don't like. They might vote for politicians that we, the, the real Virginians who want to call ourselves that, we, we don't like the politicians they might vote for, and on and on and on. So, uh, if these objections are not persuasive with respect to West Virginians, I think at the very least we should have some skepticism when they're raised against Central Americans or uh, you know, immigrants from, from elsewhere as, as well. And there are, of course, countries that do have, have pretty restrictive domestic limitations on yes. migration. Right? Yes, the, yes. The, so th th these issues do exist in China and in India. Uh, and Russia, uh, if you want to move to Moscow or St. Petersburg, uh, it's not as restrictive as it was under communism, but there's still a system of residency permits, which if you weren't born or grew up there, you, uh, you have to uh, meet. And so, uh, and of course, we can go back in earlier periods in American history where some states kept out free blacks, uh, others tried to keep out the poor on the theory that the poor from another state would overburden their state. Uh, over time, the courts have struck most of this down under various constitutional provisions, but we do have a history of this. And if you look at the arguments that were made, they look and feel very similar in most cases to ones made against international migration.
And so that's the dream for, the, for zoning, right? The, that the, the justices will look at the text of the Constitution again yeah. and realize it's unconstitutional. Uh, so right. some of it is, at least. Uh, I don't claim judicial review is the sole okay. solution for all these problems. I would merely say that it's part, it can be part of a broader reform effort. Because so we got a, a related question exactly to your, to your point that judicial review is the only uh, way to go. And I want to ask you this question now because it's in, it fits in nicely from Howard Husak, one of our colleagues here at AI. Why not promote the power of political persuasion at the local level to relax zoning? The zoning movement itself was very successful in the first two decades of the 20th century. So I'm not against local persuasion, but as various scholars have documented, uh, there are limitations. One is the local people often, the people most active in local policies tend to be, local politics tend to be the so-called NIMBYs, the not in my backyard types. So they're among the hardest people to persuade. In addition, you have this problem that if your area liberalizes, but the surrounding areas do not, then there's a kind of collective action problem that your area, you know, you, you may bear some of the costs, but the benefits, the, 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 you, you, don't get, you get full benefits only if, you know, other areas liberalize. That said, you know, there are different politics in different places, and there may be some areas which are amenable to more local solutions, but I do think historically when housing liberalization has happened, in the US and also in some other countries, it's usually happened either through some combination of judicial action or through higher level governments uh, constraining lower level yeah. ones. And I think that's more promising, but I wouldn't rule the other out completely. And there are gonna be different situations. Uh, I would add this book is not primarily about political strategy. I don't have like, you know, this is the platform a party should adopt in the next election kind of proposals. I have written about some of that, you know, elsewhere, but here, uh, in this book, I outline sort of the merits of the uh, different kinds of proposals and institutional ideas, but I don't try to engage in short-term yeah. political strategy. And a big, a big issue, of course, is a lot of the costs inside on people who are not residents, right? And that's what makes yes, it Yes, that, that's another so issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I want to be careful with that because there is a lot of evidence that most people, when they vote at the ballot box, they have other flaws like ignorance, sure. but most in, for, in most cases, you do not vote purely based on narrow self-interest. Uh, nonetheless, there is a problem here that many people who support NIMBY-type policies are not aware or understand of sort of the full cost. So uh, you get the, you know, the sort of the liberals who I think sincerely will say, I want to help the poor, I want to give them more opportunity, but they don't realize that many of the policies which block their opportunities the most are in fact sort of zoning policies in neighborhoods like theirs. They don't think about that, many okay. of them. Well, and, and as someone, as I serve on the zoning uh, committee for my local ANC here in DC. I can certainly confirm that the, the dream of free parking lives in the heart of the people. The, yeah. the, uh, let's, go to, let's go to Felipe. I know uh, you think, even though the, the book covers a ton of ground, you think it's, in a sense, not broad enough, uh, in particular <laughs> on, the, on the private sector side of things. Do you, you want to talk about that a little bit first? Uh, yeah, yeah. First of all, thanks, Stan, for inviting me uh, uh, to discuss this a really wonderful book. So, and thanks, Ilya, for, for writing the book and, and, and giving us so much, so much food for thought. And, you know, as, as an economist, I feel like this is a book that's pretty congenial to economists. Like, we're kind of, uh, you know, the, the kinds of arguments that, that, that the book makes are very uh, 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 sort of come naturally. So I agree with a lot that, that's written there. But, you know, as Stan's pointed out, I, I was sort of expecting that when you're talking about the private sector uh, foot voting, you would actually take the idea even farther than you take. So you're kind of talking about private sector foot voting in the context of privately provided substitutes, we may call them, for you know, goods and services that are you know, typically provided by the public sector. But you could consider, at, I think at least conceptually, uh, uh, sort of pure private sector foot voting. Uh, let's say when consumers choose to consume like one brand instead of another, you could take this even sort of uh, in terms of politically motivated action, you know, boycotts or, you know, what's come to be known as canceling and all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I wonder if you see there are differences there, like what are they, can we extend uh, uh, the arguments that you've uh, 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 put out there for that kind of thing? And if not, why not, basically? Yeah, go ahead. yeah, so I think it's a good point, and I largely agree with it. Uh, in this book, I didn't quite fully do this, though I did mention that there are other private sector services just besides a condominium association, a white, white, for instance, I mentioned school choice and others, yeah, yeah. but I mostly focus on those which are potential substitutes for government services. I did that 
for a couple reasons. One is simply a matter of sort of my own knowledge and expertise. I know a lot about land use having being a property professor. So if say like a tourist professor had written the same book or an economist had written the same book, depending on Duras plus Y's, might have done differently. Uh, but the other is that uh, the theme of this book is about political freedom. And the further you get away from substitutes for government services, the more it's possible to argue, well, this isn't really a political choice. It's possible to argue that even with respect to the ones that I do mention, I respond to that argument. Uh, but I didn't want to spend a lot of space in the book saying, well, no, like the choice of cereal that you buy can potentially be political choice. I do agree that it's foot voting, and I mentioned that in the book. For instance, the choice of a TV set is an example of foot voting if you can choose between different uh, brands of TVs, the choice of a car. Uh, but I think it's not as clearly political in the same way as the choice of a, an HOA or a condominium association. Of course, if you take a broad enough perspective, pretty much anything can be political. Some of us are old enough to remember the slogan, the personal is political. But I didn't want to hang my hat on that kind of idea in this book. But of course, this is one of a number of ways in which you know, this book is not the final word on its subjects, or at least I hope it's not, and others can take the uh, issue in further directions, particularly people whose expertise may lie in places different from mine. Uh, you know, there are friends who can argue something like cryptocurrency is a form of foot voting. I didn't include that because I just, you know, I'm just weak on monetary issues. It's not something I'm good at analyzing, but there are other people who are good at it. They're smarter than me. I hope they'll take up that, you know, that issue. And there's a number of other uh, th connections like that as well that, you know, that could be made. Excellent. So uh, uh, another point that I think is important to raise and I think sort of in the context of what, what in economics we call t boot competition, right, which is yes. basically food voting between local jurisdictions, there's often a concern there are major transaction costs involved that really mute the, the way in which I think you, you would agree with that, right, Philip? The... Yeah, and I think that actually, uh, uh, um, you know, the costliness of foot voting, which I think is inherent to foot voting, especially compared to like, ballot box voting, and you do kind of acknowledge that and you're, you're very aware of that, but I think it raises uh, 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 sort of issues in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, whether we want to expand, let's say, the scope of decisions that are influenced by foot voting or that are put in the in the sort of the uh, into the realm of, of foot voting. And I was thinking about that uh, uh, to some extent, as in, like like I said, I think as an economist, you know, I generally kind of agree very much with, or not kind of, I, I agree very much with. I think the freedom argument is is pretty unassailable, like the efficiency argument as well. But obviously, like what you're proposing here is not something that would be like uncontroversial, you know, among you know normies, right? As the as the kids would put it. Sure. So kind of trying to look at that and like what would be, what would make people uncomfortable, and leaving aside things like you know maybe disliking you know foreigners or or whatever. I think one thing is that costliness brings kind of a trade-off between you know freedom slash efficiency on one end and equity on the other, in the sense that foot voting from rich people is more consequent, is more accessible to rich people, although I agree that like you say extending foot voting from where it is now might actually disproportionately benefit the poor. But I think the fact remains that like if Elon Musk moves away from a jurisdiction, that has a bigger impact than my moving away from, from a jurisdiction, whereas his vote has the same weight as my vote, kind of ballot box uh, uh, vote, right? So how do we think about that? And I think that's something that kind of comes to to people's minds and like, why do I feel, uh, and because here, uh, not to extend myself too much, I think there's one argument, again, like sort of the, the freedom argument that is very interesting and I think very strong, but you're also making that case that it's like, we should expand the range of decisions that are subject to foot voting because it has these properties of better alignment, uh, you know, private and, 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 and social incentives. And part of that is actually related to the, to the costliness, right? So, how do we think about this? I think it's something you engage with in the book to some extent, but I think it's really something that would, would, would spring to mind uh, as, a, as an objection to, again, broadening the scope of foot voting as a mechanism for, for making social decisions, if you yeah, will. Yeah, to make it a bit more concrete, maybe. So the context, I think, in which people are skeptical about this in the, in the US is that of school districts, right? Where, if, yeah. where you, you, can, you can frame them as offering you know, different bundles of public services, or you can say what just ends up happening is people sort by income and the richest people sit in the school districts that have the best schools and that's, that's all that's going on. How, so is that, 
Yeah. Is that a con so, something you're concerned about? Yeah, I think that? there's three different questions here, maybe four, okay. if you add the point about <laughs> <Okay>. school districts. <laughs> and each one of them I actually do talk about in the book, maybe not enough, you could argue about whether I talk about them enough, but even the school district issue actually okay. is brought up uh, in the book. So let's take the first point first, there's gonna be a general concern about moving costs. Like, it may be great to open your feet, but it's just too costly, both because it costs money to move yourself and your stuff, but even more so that there could be other more serious moving costs you might move away from your job, your relatives and friends, the neighborhood you're born into, and so on. In the book, I discuss this at length with respect to all three types of foot voting, uh, and I have a couple of responses. One is, if you decentralize power to lower levels, moving costs are reduced, because you don't have to go as far in order to vote with your feet. If it's private sector foot voting, you might not even have to physically move at all. Uh, with school choice, for instance, you could send your kids to a different school without uh, picking up and moving in the way that you would have to with traditional government-based school districts. A second issue is maybe foot voting is just more accessible to the wealthy because they can more easily pay the moving cost. I again have two kinds of responses to this. Uh, one is in some respects that's actually not true because what you can't move is immobile assets and almost by definition the wealthy are more likely to own valuable immobile assets like property and land uh, than the poor. If you own a valuable piece of land that probably means you're not poor to begin with. And as I mentioned historically it is actually the poor and the disadvantaged have been the biggest beneficiaries of foot voting and conversely are the ones most harmed uh, by foot voting. Uh, by restrictions on foot voting of the kind that exist with international migration restrictions, but also with zoning and the like. Elon Musk can still move to San Francisco if he wants. He's actually done the opposite, but he can still has, he's still wealthy enough to buy into housing in almost any place in the world. Uh, a poorer person obviously is not in uh, that position. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can't eliminate the problem of moving costs, we can reduce it. Uh, and the benefits of foot voting are actually disproportionately for the poor and disadvantaged, both historically and today. A third issue is that it may be that if you think of foot voting exercising influence over public policy, Musk moving to Texas as he has, I think, uh, has more of an impact than if, like, if I move to Texas or whatnot, that's undoubtedly true. Uh, but as I discuss in chapter one of the book, uh, the traditional uh, ballot box voting and other mechanisms of political influence also are radically unequal in various ways uh, that you know, people who are wealthier, who are political activists, who have certain abilities, have much more influence by that means. You have to compare it not to an ideal of complete equality, but to the uh, ballot box voting system that actually exists. And I think foot voting, particularly if you liberalize it further, stacks up pretty well in respect of equity, especially if you consider that um, uh, part of equity should be that you get to make a choice that actually makes a difference. Uh, and uh, uh, even if your choice is equal in some sense to others, but you're equal in the sense that, no, that none of you has much chance of making a difference, that's not much consolation. Uh, finally, on school districts, if you adopt a school choice-like system, uh, the evidence strongly shows that that will disproportionately benefit the poor and the disadvantaged. I cite some of that evidence in the book in response to Albert Hirschman's. The, the, Albert Hirschman was a great economist, uh, and he wrote the book Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, which has an obvious overlap with some of my themes. He was by no means completely negative about exit rights, but one thing that he was concerned about in respect to school choice is maybe if you have school choice, then sort of the affluent and influential parents will move away. Uh, the poorer kids or the ones whose parents are less active will be worse off as a result. The empirical evidence doesn't seem to support that. And in reality, it is actually poor and minority children that benefit most uh, from school choice programs. Uh, and uh, conversely, increasing spending on existing public schools, the evidence suggests that the educational benefits of that are quite weak. It's not that you can't spend money in ways that improves education, it's that in the existing ballot box voting system, the incentive to do that, particularly for the poor and disadvantaged, is quite weak. Right here in Washington, D.C., we have some of the highest per capita education spending levels in the whole country, uh, but they get about the same educational outcomes as Mississippi, uh, which is not known for its great public schools. So essentially, uh, what they've done here in D.C., if they spent two, maybe twice as much money per student as Mississippi, but for the same kinds of outcomes. I would suggest that school choice, which is not perfect by any means, but nonetheless, it could do substantially better than that. Uh, at the, uh, the, you know, to get Mississippi outcomes at 
double or more the level of Mississippi's expenditures, that can't be counted as a great success, I think. I, I agree with that. So on the, this is a bit of a side note, on the, on the topic of moving costs and, um, and foot voting and political choice, one of the uh, movies nominated for Best Picture this year, Belfast, about 80% of the movie is about this topic, uh, for those of you interested. I should uh, watch it. <laughs> $5.99 on Amazon Prime, I believe. Um, the, um, uh, and so, yeah, very, very good movie. I don't know, maybe it'll win. Who knows? There's 20 nominees now, 10, I don't know, many. Um, Philippe, any, any other comments before we? Yeah, no, the, 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 the other one thing, which is, uh, I think you kind of, uh, you know, acknowledge that, and it, it's almost sort of asking too much that you kind of go deep into that. By the way, I think one, one thing that's very good about this book is that, unlike a lot of nonfiction books, it's, it's not as if like you have, you know, 50 pages that will really make your case and then the rest is filler. This is like really jam-packed with, with uh, arguments and it's really worth uh, reading like cover to cover. Uh, but I think like the issue of like the backlash uh, uh, aspect of it, which you acknowledge and, and you sort of try to do with, but, but it's, it's really like a, a, a tough nut to crack. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of unfair to, to place that, but I, I was still left with uh, uh, sort of, you know, kind of how do we how do we deal with that? And I think you make a strong argument for like why we shouldn't take that objection as a reason to restrict migration further and say, oh, we need to restrict migration because you know, that will appease uh, you know, the backlashers and therefore I think you make a, a good argument for, for why that's not persuasive. But since we wanna to move towards more uh, uh, migration, again, I think you nibble at the edges, but, but I was still left with like, uh, uh, you know, okay, like how do we, uh, how do we go from there? Because I think, uh, to, to a large extent, the lesson from the recent years is that it's not as if, like, oh, if you just restrict, let's say, unauthorized migration or illegal migration, then people will be fine with. I think it's it, it's a tougher nut to crack. But I was just uh, curious if you'd have like additional thoughts sure. uh, uh, on this that you couldn't. So. A couple of things. One is, I think, I know, I'm not sure if you have the revised edition or the original edition. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have, you have the revised edition. So the revised edition, edition yeah. I added a section dealing with this, but you're right to point out that's a section dealing with sort of the concern that you know, migration will cause backlash and have harmful effects rather than a section dealing with sort of short-term political strategy and what should be done about it. Because I deliberately tried not to have too much in this book about short-term political strategy. I feel like that's not my strong suit. That said, I have written about this a little bit elsewhere. I have a piece that I published a couple years ago called The Importance of Making the Moral Case for Migration Rights. And that is, if you look at history, uh, how is it that we have succeeded where we have an expanding sort of the circle of people who are believed entitled to human rights and uh, liberty and so forth, respect to uh, my, racial minorities, women, gays and lesbians and the like. Uh, to some extent, it's by making arguments saying sort of the specific policy objections you have to desegregation or to women in the workforce or whatnot, those objections are wrong. But to some extent, the, the biggest success of the anti-slavery movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement, and so forth, has been by emphasizing that the seeming differences between this group and the previously dominant group are superficial. So a famous slogan of the anti-slavery movement was this picture of a black man in chains, and there's an inscription which says, am I not a man and a brother, right? The idea is that a black man is fundamentally similar to a white man, therefore, any argument that you make for giving freedom to white people also applies to blacks. Similarly, the feminist movement emphasized the fundamental similarities between men and women. Uh, the gay marriage movement, which I observed and had a small part in, uh, um, emphasize the fundamental similarity between same-sex marriages and opposite-sex marriage and how they serve similar purposes. And I think the same can be said here. What we're essentially doing when we say we're gonna keep out people in, with migration restrictions is we're saying that uh, we, we're gonna keep you out, uh, we have the right to that because you made the mistake of choosing the wrong parents or choosing to be born in the wrong place. And that's not fundamentally different from saying you made the mistake of having black parents versus white parents or in an earlier era, you made the mistake of being born a serf as opposed to being born a noble. We can all clearly see you know, why this is wrong with respect to that and it's wrong for similar reasons uh, here. Uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't pay attention to specific policy issues, crime, 
the welfare state spreading disease and other than in fact have detailed sections devoted to these issues, just as with desegregation or women in the workforce, you know, people raise these issues, wouldn't black labor compete with white labor? If women enter the workforce, who will take care of the children? Wouldn't men's wages be depressed? You know, th these kind of arguments were made. Uh, but I think overcoming them with specific detailed policy proposals was a less important part, uh, avenue to political success than making this moral case. Uh, everybody remembers uh, Martin Luther King's speech saying that the content of your character matters more than the color of your skin. Only experts remember the report of John F. Kennedy's Council of Economic Advisors, which pointed out correctly that if you eliminate segregation, the American economy will be more productive because more blacks could realize their full potential and that would benefit not just them, but also white people. But absolutely true, uh, but did not gain nearly as much traction. Similarly, the emphasis on human rights in the anti-slavery movement uh, gained much more traction than Hinton Helper's book, The Impending Crisis, which is well known, somewhat well known at the time. Helper argued that abolishing slavery would be good for the narrow economic interests of poor whites in the South. He was a somewhat famous figure at the time, but he was nowhere near as successful as Uncle Tom's Cabin, which made the case that slavery is just wrong and oppressive uh, because uh, black slaves were fundamentally similar to uh, whites. When you read Uncle Tom's Cabin, there's not much there about sort of possible economic side effects of the abolition of slavery or whatnot. Um, it's all about sort of the, 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 this moral appeal which is readily accessible to, you know, to non-experts, people who don't follow economic policy in any detail. And so when we look at, at, at your book and the policies you defend, the arguments you make, the reason why those policies are not Reality, that's because advocates are not successful enough in making this, this moral case, or what? So the there is multiple uh, interlocking political issues. Uh, I don't try to sort of address the sort of short-term political economy of reform. I would only note the case that, uh, the, and I do note this in the book, that uh, the best should not be the enemy of the good. We can't abolish all or nearly all migration restrictions in the near future. But even reducing those barriers by 10% means many millions of people will be helped. And similarly, internally, maybe we can't abolish all exclusionary zoning, but say we cut it back by 30%, that means also hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people can move to opportunity within the United States. Uh, huge benefits for them, also huge benefits uh, for society as a whole. Uh, so this is an area where even if you say like your full program will never be realized, may be true. Uh, if it's even partially realized and there are ways to make gains uh, which are clearly politically feasible, uh, that's still uh, an enormous uh, benefit. Just like, it's not a perfect analogy, but abolishing slavery in some states was an important gain even before it was abolished everywhere. Abolishing some types of racial discrimination in government was an important gain even though it wasn't say till 1967 uh, that we abolished all restrictions, on all laws banning interracial marriage. Uh, but abolishing, for instance, as early as 1917, explicitly race-based zoning, that was an important gain even back then. Uh, a colleague and I have an article devoted to this, even though there were lots of other uh, forms of racial discrimination that continued to exist. Excellent. Any comments before we, Emily, you want to? So let's take uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I also have an iPad here from which I can see our virtual audience. Um, but let's go here first. Anyone? Questions about the book, about the broader topics? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I think I understand you. That you don't Sorry, do you mind? So the, I, I haven't done this for like two and a half years, but do you, can you state your name and yeah. brief like one sentence introduction and then my the questions are supposed to end in a question mark. Yeah. My, <laughs> okay. my, Thank my you. name is Gerald Chandler and I'm a frequent visitor to API or at least before COVID. Um, as I understand you, you are against uh, restrictions on immigration. And I'd like to ask you if, uh, if that's so, uh, what would you say about 100 million Nigerians wanting to come to the United States in one year? Uh, so uh, this is a good question. It's actually something that I address in the book. It's, we could call it the swamping scenario. Uh, and I respond to it at two levels, uh, or three rather. One is that you could say the same thing. What if 30 million Californians wanted to move to Texas in one year? You could say Texas couldn't handle that many, at least not that quickly. Uh, so this is another area where you can make objections to internal migration that are uh, equivalent. The second thing that I would say about this and do in fact say in the book is that uh, when you drop barriers to migration, 
migration on that scale simply doesn't happen that fast for a variety of reasons, including the adjustment of labor markets, land use markets, and so forth. Uh, so therefore, I think in some ways it's a, it's a false scenario when we had, and in some cases still do have, uh, in some places of the world, sort of little or no barrier to migration. The migration that happens is slower over time. Uh, it can be quite large over a period of 10, 20, 30 years, but that, of course, gives labor markets and other institutions uh, time to adjust. I would finally add in the specific case of Nigerian immigrants, statistically speaking, this may be the single most productive immigrant group uh, in the United States in terms of their productivity, their contribution to scientific research and the like. So if we doubled or tripled the amount of Nigerian immigration, that would obviously be a benefit to the Nigerian immigrants, but it would also be of enormous benefit to the rest of us because we would benefit from their innovation, productivity and the like, which of course is much greater in the US than if they had to stay in Nigeria. So uh, 100 million in a year, I think, is not much more plausible than 30 million Californians moving to Texas, or the entire population of Mississippi moving to wealthier I states. I don't think like, you've answered the question. The question is, is it good or bad that 100 million come in one year? Uh, I think I've tried, but the question I've tried to answer is the question of whether this sort of scenario should lead us to support migration restrictions, and I've tried to explain why the answer is no. Well, yeah. let me try one more time. Is it bad that 100 million Nigerians come in one year? It would not be bad if it were possible for them to do so. As I've just explained, in the real world, it's not possible for them to do so even if all legal migration restrictions were dropped. But in a world where it was possible, it would be good because it would mean that housing, labor markets, and so forth could adjust much faster than they do in the real world. Uh, so I, I, so I, I think you know, that would be my answer. I think we'll leave it at one, one perhaps informative illustration of how relatively small these flows are, even in a situation of, uh, of, of open borders, is the European Union, where despite pretty dramatic differences in, in incomes per capita, uh, you, you, you really don't see, see large flows, certainly yeah. not as a Yeah, as I a mentioned that example in the book. Yeah. If anything, one objection to some of my arguments that I take up in the book is the idea that when the borders are open, you don't see all the large gains because the level of migration is relatively small. Some people have said this about the European Union. I think only something like 5 to 10 percent of the people in the European Union live in countries other than the one that they were born in. If you look at Puerto Rico, which is much poorer than the mainland U.S., only a relatively at any given time and in a given year, only a relatively small percentage of the Puerto Rican population moved to the mainland. So some economists like George Borjas have therefore said, well, you're not going to realize these big gains because people wouldn't move. And he also argues, he also argues where maybe too many people would move as well. So he's a little bit contradictory. Uh, my response to the too few people uh, would move argument is that uh, there is accumulation over time, which is quite significant. And also the gains are not just from the people who specifically move, but also from their children and grandchildren. Uh, so those you know, gains you know, accumulate over time. But the example of the EU uh, and also Puerto Rico is some sign that if you drop barriers, you would not simply see you know, 100 million in a year or even 10 million from one country in a year. Uh, but over time, you would see a significant effect. And I think that effect is a feature uh, rather than a bug. The, um, uh, uh, I think George Borjas and, and Michael Clemens, who I think is the, the other side here, they are fighting various battles, I think, at the same time. And so they, yeah. they don't necessarily have to use internally consistent arguments on different parts <laughs> yeah. of the battlefield. So I think uh, uh, Michael Clemens, a very important immigration <laughs> yeah. economist, I think uh, no one's work in this area is perfect, including my own. Uh, uh, but I think Clemens is less internally inconsistent than uh, than Borjas, and I think if you're simultaneously arguing both that, have, that a huge number of people will come and thereby destroy our institutions, but also arguing that only a small number of people will come and therefore uh, you know, the economic gains won't be realized, uh, then you know, that's, that there's, there's just a very blatant contradiction there. Uh, and a leading economist, which Borjas is, should, should know better than to argue both of those things uh, simultaneously. I think that's fair. Let's go over here. Yeah, I'm Jerry Mayer. I'm over at the Shar School at George Mason. And I agree with you. I think zoning is, is a big problem on this issue. But I, my question is, why is it OK for uh, HOAs to have, in effect, a, a very, very tight zoning regulation on housing size and yard size, and, and, and they're, they're very fixed. 
They don't evolve. So if you have a single family HOA, it's going to be that way for 50 years or more, forever. And if we get what you want, which is an expansion of private HOAs and private government, then uh, won't that contribute to this housing crisis and so on? So give so, me a second. Sorry, Lydia, I'm, 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 I'm being scolded here. The online audience cannot necessarily hear your question, so I'll repeat it through, yeah. my, through my mic. Uh, the, the question, and correct me if I'm completely misrepresenting uh, what, what you asked, is uh, HOAs can be much more restrictive than local governments and can continue to exist in perpetuity without any uh, real chance of reform. Uh, why do you praise them if they create many of the problems that your, uh, yeah. your foot voting uh, arguments are supposed to, yeah. to, to deal with? with. Population density. That, yeah. That, that yeah. So, yeah. So, so I think I already at least partly answered that issue in response to a similar question before, which is that HOAs, uh, at least a general rule, cannot occupy anywhere near as large a space as zoning rules can. And therefore, if one HOA in an area is highly restrictive, that just creates incentives for others in the same area to offer a different, less restrictive product. I would add that I would contest a little bit. I mean, I, it, there's certainly in HOAs, like in a lot of other institutions, there's some inertia over time. But HOAs and condo boards and the like, they do have provisions for making changes over time. And many of them have made various changes over time in response to different kinds of demand. Uh, the final point that I would make on this, and I, I say this in the book, it just hasn't come up in the questions before, is that I do object to laws that exist in some areas which essentially require an HOA to exist in, uh, in, in particular areas, and I think that is both an unwarranted imposition on property rights and it could potentially have exclusionary effects as well in that HOAs not only should compete with other HOAs, but they should compete with non-HOA forms of housing organization in the same area, and therefore I do not support what exists in some regions of the country that are essentially laws which either say you have to have an HOA in every neighborhood or at least pressure people in that direction. Uh, so one, one, one point I would, I would add that's somewhat related is that in the public, in the public debate, it, always, it often seems like it's, uh, it's DC and San Francisco and New York and Boston that have the tightest zoning restrictions. Um, but that's not really true. Right? It's where they are most binding, but it really is the inner suburbs around those high cost areas. So suburbs vary a lot, but yes, there are restrictions in the suburbs, and I, I do not hesitate to criticize suburbs on this basis. I live in a suburb myself, and uh, nonetheless, I, you know, I have urged people in Arlington County where I live to lift the restrictions, and uh, you know, it may at the margin reduce the value of my house if it, if it does happen. On the other hand, it'll, it'll, it'll hurt my narrow economic self-interest. It'll actually benefit the interests of my kids. I have two kids. Uh, when they grow up, I'd like them, if they want to, to be able to live in a place like Arlington and not have to pay the same exorbitant prices. Uh, and this is actually a point that is worth emphasizing in political debates that if you look at the narrow self-interest of current residents, you just ask like, how much is your house gonna be worth? There is a good chance the zoning reform will reduce that number. On the other hand, if they also have kids, which many of us do, uh, then there is a trade-off that your kids will have more opportunity to live near you or in other similar places, and many people greatly value that, whether or not that fits sort of the narrow model of homo economicus, or sort of the, the purely self-interested person. Uh, you know, it's, it is something that many, most parents do value, uh, and I would like my kids to be able to live in a place like Arlington, even if they don't have jobs as, you know, as lucrative as being a law professor, and my wife is also a lawyer, so we, between us, have a pretty high income, but if my kids choose to professions which are not as high income as that, I hope that they would still have uh, access to housing in places like Arlington, uh, and that's something that I, I think a lot of parents share aspirations like that. So an online question that is, uh, again, touches on, on zoning, uh, is in addition to zoning reform, do we have to delink welfare benefits from geography? Um, this has been proposed by some scholars, like David Schweiker. Uh, I would say a couple of things on this, and I admit I could have said more on this in the book than, uh, than I did, because in the book I deliberately said, I'm gonna set aside the question of sort of how much redistribution there should be in a society, and I would merely point out that expanded foot voting is, is compatible with a wide range of different levels of redistribution. I will make uh, one point that I made in the book and another point that is not in the book but could be added. Uh, one is that if you allow expanded foot voting, there will be much less need for welfare benefits because many more people will have access to uh, sort of more lucrative jobs. 
Uh, uh, secondly, uh, it could be the case that the right approach is to have sort of welfare benefits provided by the central government rather than by local or regional governments. And I'm not the first one to, you know, to point that out. A number of scholars like Paul Peterson and others have uh, said that that would be desirable. Uh, this and it, it addresses Felipe's uh, earlier comment too, right, about shorting by income. The, yeah, the um, it, it, it would f further address it. So my own view is that the best anti-poverty program is simply foot voting itself. Uh, that's in, in, that's the, what has lifted more people out of poverty than virtually anything else in the history of the modern world. Uh, but if you believe we should have more redistribution on top of that, then maybe there is a case for making that redistribution more centralized, even as we make most other functions of government more decentralized. And this comes down to sort of your views on sort of whether there should be some kind of minimum welfare floor, and if so, you know, what it should be. So I believe you sent me a question. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, I'm Phil. I go to uh, UC San Diego as a PhD student. Uh, my question is, do we need more cities? For the online audience, do we need more cities? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, my tentative answer is probably the answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, in the book, I briefly discuss ideas like charter cities. Uh, you know, people, uh, uh, have, some scholars have proposed setting up more new cities, including in the third world, to uh, as foot voting options, I think I'm open to that. You could say this is a scaled up version of the idea of homeowners association or condominiums. At the same time, I'm somewhat skeptical of this as the primary solution to sort of bad governance or people being forced to live under bad government, even though some people do say this is the primary solution. The reason why I'm skeptical is that setting up an entire new city is much more costly than simply allowing freedom of movement between existing ones. In addition, I'm less optimistic than some of the advocates of this are that existing political jurisdictions will allow the setting up of new charter cities in the way you can say, well, you can be pessimistic about setting up, uh, you know, breaking down barriers to migration, but with barriers to migration, you can incrementally reduce them. On the other hand, it's much harder to have an incremental charter city, though I suppose you could say maybe the new city will have autonomy on some issues, but not on others, or others have proposed uh, reviving uh, what you used to be called the treaty ports in China where European governments controlled certain ports in China and European law prevailed there rather than that of the Chinese empire. I'm not on principle opposed to things like this, but it's obviously hard to bring off and it would raise accusations of neo-colonialism. I myself I'm not in Prince, as I said, I'm not in principle opposed to it. I think when you look at colonialism, it can be very bad. We have to compare it, you know, will the native regime be better? And sometimes the answer is yes, but sometimes uh, it might be no. Uh, you know, replacing the government of North Korea with neo-colonialism would be a significant improvement, even if the neo-colonialists were, you know, far from ideal. Uh, with other governments, it might be different, a different story. Let me add to that, and I don't know if Emily wants to respond too. I, I am skeptical of this. Uh, to the extent that you believe that a lot of the what we value in cities is agglomeration effects and and their sheer size and scale, obviously creating smaller new ones you know undermines those benefits of letting people move to the the current large high density places. Uh, yeah, so. I would say if if you have a moment, can I say a word about agglomeration effects? Sure. So because this is covered in the book because my former colleague David Schweiker for years said, Ilya, you have to write about agglomeration effects. Why are you ignoring this very important argument against your thesis? So finally I said, okay, fine, I'm gonna do it. And I did it in this book. Uh, for those who may not know, agglomeration effects are the idea that often what we benefit from is being in proximity to a large number of other people with similar interests and skills and the like. So Silicon Valley, for example, benefit, it, it, part of its benefit is that there's a lot of people working in high tech in the same place. And that's, and if you're a high tech worker, you can be more productive in Silicon Valley than if you're like by yourself in the, uh, you know, uh, in the Alaskan tundra or something. Uh, maybe remote work reduces uh, these effects, but they're still significant. And the problem for my thesis is that if people need to be where there is an agglomeration, then their foot voting options are greatly reduced. Uh, and in the book, I offer two responses to this. One is there can be different agglomerations for the same thing. Uh, so uh, it's notable that Silicon Valley competes 
with similar agglomerations in the Route 128 area in Boston, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, more recently Austin, Texas, where Elon Musk has moved, right, and some others as well, uh, has, has this agglomeration. So there is still some competitive options. Secondly, within the agglomerations, you can break it up into more jurisdictions. Uh, maybe all the Silicon Valley uh, high-tech people need to be close to each other, but it doesn't follow that Silicon Valley should have only one or a few political jurisdictions, and it can certainly have many private plan communities, so there can be competition within the agglomeration. Uh, now, David is only partly satisfied with my responses to his concerns, and he and I, I'm sure, will continue to have this issue out in the future. Yeah, just to add a, a little piece, I think like if we marginally increase foot voting right now, probably the effect would be to increase the agglomeration effects, right? Because we will be moving towards these agglomerations. That's kind of part of the problem but with the current zoning law. So I think at least from where we are right now, it kind of cuts both ways. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I was mostly attacking our audience member who asked whether we needed more cities. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think the ability to create new cities is something that should be tried. It could create new foot voting options. And in some cases, we may not fully know what can be achieved until we try it. Uh, and so while I'm, I'm not as enthusiastic as the big enthusiast for this idea, neither am I one of those who says, well, it's, it's stupid, reject it entirely. It's a little bit like some of you may be familiar with the University of Austin, which was recently set up to compete with more traditional universities, including my own. A lot of actors are like, no, this is terrible, this is stupid, what they're doing is ridiculous. And you know, maybe it is, but it, but it should be tried. And it's worth noting that many of our great universities today, like Johns Hopkins, the University of Chicago, uh, and others were set up in the late 19th and early 20th century to compete with the Harvards and the Yales. And they offered a new model of a research university that eventually Harvard and Yale had to imitate to some degree at least to compete with. So if we could do this 100 years ago in a much wealthier society today, we might be able to successfully set up new universities and perhaps uh, new cities as well. Uh, you know, they're, they're each of the great cities we have today, at some point people moved there and started up something that, you know, that wasn't there before. And there are some great success stories. The establishment of Tel Aviv in the 1920s from a, you know, a tiny initial start. Uh, um, uh, you know, in an earlier age, the establishment of Montreal by Champlain and, and others. If, if that could be done before, maybe it can be done now. Almere, which I think is the eighth largest Dutch city, was water until the 1950s. Yeah, that's uh, a good, good example. Um, any other questions? Yes, please go ahead. Let me repeat the question first, sorry. Um, the question is, is it problematic if only a very small percentage of people who move, move for explicitly political choice related reasons? It's a good question. It's actually one I talk about at some length in chapter one of the book. I just didn't include it in the presentation because I couldn't include everything. Uh, and I would say if there are very few or if any moves which are driven by policy differences between governments, then that I don't think that would prove people should be prevented from doing it, but it would certainly reduce the potential advantages from allowing foot voting. Uh, and I certainly do not claim that all movement between jurisdictions is foot voting. If you move to Florida because you like the hot weather, that's pretty obviously not foot voting. Uh, perhaps if you move because you want to be close to a relative or something, that's probably also not foot voting. That said, a lot of things uh, which we initially may think of as non-political actually have a policy dimension. For example, many people move because of jobs or housing, but jobs and housing are heavily influenced by variations in government policy. 
uh, both directly through regulation of labor markets and housing markets and indirectly in various ways. For example, areas that are more tolerant to various minorities, racial, religious minorities, gays and lesbians and the like also tend to be more productive. Uh, and so you might move to that area not because you like tolerance for its own sake, but because you like the economic consequences, but that's still, that move has a political dimension. If you reject the argument that it has a political dimension, then you also have to reject the argument that a lot of ballot box voting is political because, of course, a lot of ballot box voting is driven by short-term economic changes of various kinds. People vote for one party or another in part because you know, they think the economy is doing well or doing badly uh, or whatnot. So if you look at the data, a very high percentage of moves are driven by economic factors, which are influenced by policy. And particularly if you look internationally, many are also driven by even more direct policy considerations, such as is your group being persecuted in this particular country or not? Uh, uh, and in, in the new edition of the book in particular, I present data indicating that there's a heavy tendency of people to move to freer societies in both economic and social dimensions. Uh, democracies versus non-democracies uh, and so forth. So not all moves have a political dimension. I totally get that, but a very large percentage do. Uh, and if we reduce barriers to migration, probably even more uh, would have that dimension than uh, is currently the case. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and I'm going to uh, put that. Let me answer the, let me repeat the question. So the question is, if we reduce land use restrictions, if we reduce uh, zoning restrictions, how can that help the poor and dispossessed if there is no level of market rate housing at which they will be able to, to afford it? That's the question. Yeah. So uh, the consensus, to the extent that there's any consensus, is actually the opposite of what you describe. Both left and right wing economists and policy experts, if they agree on one thing, it's that zoning barriers to building new housing are hugely harmful to the poor and the dispossessed. You ask, well, how can they afford market housing, uh, market price housing? The market price is dictated in considerable part by supply. Uh, zoning restrictions artificially constrict supply in many places to the point where it's almost impossible to build new housing in response to demand. Uh, just like if you allow people to grow more wheat in response to demand for food, the price of bread will fall. Similarly, if you allow people to build more housing in response to the demand for housing, uh, then the price of housing will fall. Uh, and in addition, if you drop restrictions on the types of housing, like the many places which allow only single family homes and the like, uh, then you can, that would incentivize more construction of housing specifically geared to the lower middle class and the poor. Uh, economic theory says this, but so does empirical evidence. If you look at American cities like Houston, which have few or no zoning restrictions, even though Houston has had a huge increase in demand over the last 20 years, housing prices remain relatively low there. There's a similar story to be told about other cities in the South and the Southwest, which have had huge growth in recent decades, but prices have not gone up enormously or even in some places have, have stayed the same or gone down. It's because you can build new housing in response to demand, just like if you know, more people want bread or other foodstuffs, if farmers are allowed to grow more in response to demand, that lowers the price and uh, particularly benefits the poor and disadvantaged. Sure. Um, so uh, at some level you can say all of the world is constrained by land supply and that at least for the next thousands or millions of years wherever we have a fixed amount of land. That said, in places like Washington and New York and San Francisco and the like, uh, you, I would say two things. One is there is space in the suburbs 
And even in the central city, you can build much more housing on the existing uh, properties because, uh, for instance, uh, DC has constraints on how tall you can build the buildings. You can build a taller building with much more housing than uh, exists currently. Uh, David Schweiker had a good article about this in The Atlantic seven or eight years ago. The problem persists still. Uh, and in addition to building up, there are some buildings which are uh, zoned for parking or for commercial uses and the like that could be converted to residential uses. So there are many, many ways in which the land in Washington, D.C. and other coastal cities could be used more f efficiently, either by building further up, by building different types of structures that are there now, and by other combinations of measures. Uh, so I think we're nowhere near the point where, uh, even on current states of technology, where we've saturated the amount of housing that can be built either here in D.C. or in many, many of these other cities. I would add, if we were at that point, then uh, that would mean that zoning restrictions just aren't doing anything, so we could at least still drop them. Maybe we'd find that by dropping them, we'd have only a small effect, but uh, the people who support these restrictions, they implicitly concede that we could build more because you know, they, they don't want certain kinds of things to be built. They want things to stay as they are. Uh, so the argument that things are saturated would just imply that dropping the restrictions would have little effect. Let me emphasize how true this is. Right? If you look at just the, the district itself, and all of War Three, you're basically not allowed to build anything that's more than in 90% of the 90% of the land. You're not allowed to build anything that's more than two floors. In in the other 10%, the the limit is four stories maybe, um, and that's true in Ward One. It's true in Ward Six. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, most of it is single-family housing, and that's yeah. and that's by law, right? You you go to prison if you try to build something bigger. Yeah. Uh, or, or at the very least, yeah. your building project will be shut down. <laughs> Part of the rationale for this is the fear that people will build things taller than the Washington Monument, and you won't be able to see the monument anymore. But that restriction is only binding in a small, small part yeah. of the city. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, right. so my, my point is that yeah. justification, to the yeah. extent that it's valid at all. It might be for things right around the Washington Monument, but for things several miles away, I think you can still see the monument in all its glory and yet also enjoy lower cost housing if they would let us. And we can, of course, also make the monument taller. We can make the monument taller, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you to our online audience as well. Uh, thank you to our beloved and esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, maybe a round of applause for our uh, for our authors and our discussions here. Thank you, so uh, thank you all for doing this.